The first lesson for this first Sunday after Christmas is from Isaiah, chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thank you. The second lesson is from the fourth chapter of Galatians. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until a date set by his father. In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. O Lord, have mercy on us. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus up to Bethlehem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For mine eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
I bring your Christmas greetings from our brother in Christ, Pastor James Hopkins, who prepared this message for you in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're finding the afterglow of Christmas Day just a bit dimmer than what you expected it to be when thinking about it on Christmas Eve, you're not alone. Even Jesus' mommy is a little bit troubled. In this morning's Gospel text, it's been just 40 days since Mary gave birth, just over a month since there were angel choirs belting out hymns of praise, and unlikely visitors gathered around the manger to worship their new king. Jesus is still in swaddling cloths with that newborn smell. But now, all of a sudden, things aren't as wonderful as she once expected them to be. After all, the usually reliable Archangel Gabriel had brought her great news. Gabriel said, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Well, that was the start of a really great Christmas story. But now, only a couple of pages into it, it feels as if there's been a mistake. According to Luke, Simeon was getting all of his, his lines right, right up until the part where he said, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Well, those are troubling words, and Mary had expected nothing but joyful blessings. Instead, what she got was rising and falling, swords and pierced hearts. Maybe this year your Christmas isn't going the way you thought it should either. Maybe stress and frustration have already boiled over while excitement and piety have simmered down. For that, you may be feeling like St. Mary, you know, a bit troubled or confused or crestfallen. That's what happens when we project our expectations onto others. Parents do it to their kids all the time and kids do it right back. You may have had some expectations for the baby Jesus, too. One of them was probably the unrealistic hope that he would somehow, in some way, never grow up. Babies, after all, are cute and cuddly, more lovable and easier to understand than their adult counterparts. Most mothers want their children to stay little forever, to protect them. They know what the world is like, and they want to save them from it. That urge for control among us comes in lots of forms. For some, it's the desire to snatch back the sins that you left at the foot of the manger. It's not fair that this baby should have to deal with them. For others, it's the well-intentioned but ultimately false belief that this year, you're really going to somehow not take them back. While that control is certainly on opposite ends of the spectrum, both responses attempt to take you away from Jesus, the very sins he's come to take away from you. So it's a wonderful thing that on a day like today, when we see familiar temptations on the horizon, that we can take our cue from old Simeon, led by the Spirit. Where Mary is now worried that Gabriel's prophecy may mean the death of her child, Simeon rejoices in the very same fact. He sees Christmas and Easter all bundled up in this little boy. This child, for Simeon, is the one he has been waiting for his whole life to see. God had promised him that he would not die until he set his eyes on the Lord's Christ, and here it is. He knows what Isaiah wrote. He knows that the Lord's anointed will be a suffering servant, but that's why he rejoices. That's why he says what he says. He starts with praises and light and salvation and revelation and glory and proceeds quickly to suffering and death. Simeon is telling Mary and Joseph, and you and me, that the glory of this child is not fully known in a manger, but on a cross. And he, Simeon, personally, doesn't need to stick around for another 33 years for confirmation. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. One thing that gets overlooked is that Simeon speaks those words as he holds the infant Jesus in his arms. Simeon wasn't promised that he would hear about Jesus or read about Jesus in a book. Simeon was promised that he would see Jesus, that he would receive him, 
There in Simeon's arms is the creator of all things. He can leave the temple. There is nothing left there for him. The new temple is child-sized with a capital C. Now Simeon can die and enter into the very kingdom he so recently held in his arms. Perhaps that's what inspired the famous reformer Martin Chemnitz to comment that one should approach the Lord's Supper as if he were going to his death, so that when one goes to his death, it will be as if he is going to the Lord's Supper, especially when you consider that you are. That sums up how Simeon, how Simeon feels. Nothing is going to ruin the joy of his Christmas, or it's hidden on the far side of Jesus' cross. Of course, that won't make it easy for Mary to surrender her son, and maybe it won't make it easy for you to surrender control of your life. But the same Holy Spirit given to Simeon is given to you in your baptism and here in his word. He has created in you the same faith and the same Savior, the consolation of Israel, the redemption of Jerusalem. So if the afterglow of Christmas is dimmer than you expected, take heart that the light shines forever, not from an empty manger, but from an empty tomb. And you may depart here in peace according to God's word, word for your eyes have seen what your lips have tasted, and will receive again soon your salvation, Jesus Christ, the Lord's anointed, in the flesh. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God. 